Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this uh, sponsored session, the second part uh, for the sponsored uh, session. And this is going to be on evolving approaches in the planning and also in the guiding of uh, treatment of, for complex PCI and also the use of ultra-low contrast uh, in multivessel disease. So, uh, and this is uh, generally sponsored uh, by, a uh, general sponsored uh, by, uh, or grant from uh, Philips. So with me is the Dr. Fahim uh, Jafari, who's going to be the moderator and a co-chair with me. Uh, he's from Singapore, Dr. Sydney Lowe from Sydney, Australia, and who's going to be discussing. We have got two presenters, Dr. Aaron Wong from Singapore and Dr. Roberto uh, Spina from uh, Australia. And we have online here from uh, Singapore, Dr. Chin Chi Yang, and he's going to be the chat master. This is going to be an on-site and off uh, uh, a virtual uh, participation. So please key in all your questions uh, to be answered by the chat master. Fahim, would you like to remind our audience on how to, uh, they can interact uh, with us? Right, so. Right, thank you, Rosli. So welcome, everyone. Um, I think you have, you have two options. You can either put your questions in the chat group or you can uh, actually raise your hand and uh, uh, put your questions in person. We do encourage everyone to put in questions and we want to make this session as interactive as possible. So without further ado, I think, uh, you know, uh, maybe do you want to introduce Aaron to come and uh, present the first case? Right. So we have uh, the first presenter is Dr. Aaron Wong, and he's going to touch about how to manage uh, complex lesion, in this case, left mean stem, in particular, the left circumflex lesion. Aaron? Thank you, uh, Rosli, for the introduction. So my topic today given is uh, uh, left main bifurcation with either left circumflex and or LED lesion. So I have nothing to declare. So this is a case introduction. The 69-year-old uh, man, uh, cardiovascular risk factors of diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, lipidemia, and ex-heavy smoker, has stage 3 CKD with baseline creatinine of 180 to 200. Uh, he had a past history of um, ischemic heart disease, had a non stemi in uh, about 15 years ago with PCI to the LAD and RCA with normal LVEF but regional wall uh, in the LAD. Uh, in most recently, 2020, uh, uh, nuclear perfusion scan showed a very mild uh, irre irreversible defect in the inferior wall uh, with a stress defect of 5%. So admitted for chest pain and mild troponin leak in August this year. And uh, investigation showed... Um, um, the, the HP of significance is 10.8, platelet 126, creatinine 185, and uh, EGA 535. LVEF is normal with regional wall in the inferior territory. So he underwent a diagnostic coronary angiogram. So this is a rotational angiogram uh, done using the Philips expert swing. Uh, as you can see, there is a um, uh, distal left main lesion uh, with a high OM branch lesion as well, and some uh, borderline instant uh, lesions. Uh, in the LAD, uh, and also the RCA uh, meet instant uh, quite tight lesions as well. So this is the uh, extra fixed angle shots uh, showing the um, uh, LAD, and as well as the spider view uh, showing the uh, left main bifurcation. So um, uh, I forgot to put it down, the FFR to the LAD is uh, 0 0.7, and FFR to the um, uh, circumflex is 0 0.78, and uh, to the uh, uh, RCA is 0 0.74. So um, uh, it was um, recommended for um, CABG and seen by the surgeon, agreeable for CABG was planned in uh, last month, but was admitted before the, uh, uh, the operation date with angina and complicated by fever. And there's a uh, downward trend of the hemoglobin and duplet scan uh, uh, prior to uh, CABG showed that there's left circlavian artery stenosis with steel syndrome. And after discussion with patient and family uh, pros and cons of left main PCI decision was made for PCI. Uh, so some uh, points for discussion. Let's uh, put up that uh, points for discussion uh, so that we can have, we have about four minutes. Uh, Dr. Roberto, PCI are, are right or the left main stem first? Uh, I'll probably start with the right coronary artery so that um, you have a bit more um, uh, reserve once you tackle the left main. Oh, there we go. Yes, uh, I would agree. I think um, uh, that would be very reasonable. I think that when you look at these angiograms, you decide what is achievable results and uh, because it's a progress if you're doing everything in one reverse procedure. So if you're saying you're doing the RCA before you left main, but in the same procedure, uh, I think you're deciding about the risk. So I think it's very reasonable to do that. 
Maybe I can ask Sydney, would you consider identifying one of them as the culprit and treating the rest medically, especially in the light of more recent data, or would you just fix it all anyway? Yeah, so I think the physiology is driving this a little bit because both are very ischemic and need to be revascularized. Um, I will also routinely do pullbacks. And so, for example, now I have pullback where I identify the lesions, either a left main or LAD, uh, which maybe uh, can limit or make it more economical to plan your PCR procedure, in which case you're hitting the hemodynamically significant lesions during the case, make for better planning, uh, the pullback may be very useful. I think uh, there are two other uh, uh, you know, uh, points that uh, needs uh, to be carried out for the discussion, which is uh, the concern of the instant risk neurosis uh, in the LED and also the tra trafication. Uh, how would you approach this in terms of uh, managing your strategy? Yeah. Um, I guess this, this patient, he's relatively young, he's diabetic, multivessel disease with instant restenosis. I think he really has a mortality advantage um, by undergoing coronary artery bypass surgery. So one consideration would be, well, could you stent the left subclavian and then put him up for surgery again? But I think PCI obviously is feasible, but um, inferior to surgery. I think we've looked at, like for syntax scoring, people with multivessel disease particularly, we look at the anatomical complexity of the lesions. We look at the comorbidities like syntax 2 score. But overall, the discussion largely relates to a balance about the risk of PCI long-term versus bypass surgery. In diabetics, it seems to outweigh a lot from freedom trial, et cetera, versus syntax scoring. Uh, when diabetes was only 33%, it wasn't so predictive. But overall, the patient characteristics would drive that. The only risk of a surgery is the early hazard of death, wounds, uh, need for precipitating CKD into renal failure and dialysis, which is a very unpleasant lifestyle, and rapid drop-off of patients. And, of course, stroke, which people don't talk about very much, particularly surgeons, but there is a slight high risk of stroke with surgery. I can totally understand when you present this to the patient, Bypass surgery is indicated for multivessel disease and diabetics, but these are the, the things you might come with along the baggage, and they say, I don't want that. And that may drive the PCI decision, particularly if the anatomical complexity is equipoise, your syntax score less than 23, 22, um, you know, you, it's a good discussion about the equipoise as of both revast procedures. But overall, yes, we can understand that that's the case. Those are important points, uh, but uh, finally, if you go strategically, technically, how would you approach this? Because here is a, in a person who, who looks as if he's got a trafication lesion. Yeah. So, so I think the, the, the anatomy is complex enough. Of course, you fix the right first. I agree with that. That's easy. But then you're left with this uh, left main LED circumflex bifurcation. And I think there you have to have a pretty rational and balanced approach. On the one hand... Uh, two stent strategy makes sense, you know, and uh, my preference would be DK crush, but it could be cool out or it could be uh, tap or something else. The flip side, though, must be considered that this is a high bleeding risk patient. Uh, this is a patient with whose hemoglobin is downtrending. Uh, this is a patient who's, uh, you know, um, has a high tendency to bleed. And so uh, I would certainly weigh that into the equation. And, you know, I may actually decide to do this provisionally if I'm very worried about the bleeding risk. Uh, because nothing's worse than uh, putting in two stents and then having to stop antiplatelets. Uh, on the flip side, though, uh, the most robust option based on the data would still be to do a two stent strategy up front. I think the last point that uh, Aaron brings up is the, the fact that the person has got CKD, and obviously one has to be con um, careful with the amount of contrast, uh, even to the point of perhaps even thinking about uh, you know, techniques to, for ultra-low contrast or even to stage the procedure. And I would believe that imaging would be an important aspect here. Aaron, did, uh, tell us uh, what you did after this. Okay, um, just mention about the case strategy. So the plan is to do the RCA first, then stage the left coronary arteries in two, three, four weeks' time, pending on the creatinine uh, trend. And um, my strategy is uh, for radio assess um, uh, using six French. That's my usual uh, um, sort of uh, 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 size of the, the guider. And uh, the intention is to wire all three vessels and use IVERS to in integrate all the three branches, especially to check if the LED stand actually cross the left main. That will uh, impact on the, the, the strategy as well. And to make it less complex, um, I'm going to try to uh, DCB the high OM branches, uh, the branch. And then um, for the uh, LED and CERC, um, I 
plan to do an upfront two stand technique. I prefer DK Crush because it's a very versatile for all bifurcation angles. It maintains the wire position in the main branch, allow larger differences in main branch and side branch reference diameter. And there is no overstretching of side branch stand cell uh, as in, in culotte. And also there's good supporting data. So the stands I will elect with, uh, 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 with short DABT indication because of the high bleeding risk and to do as minimal contrast as possible. And that will require using the IVUS, yeah. So, um, uh, I'm going to just present some short uh, uh, data on, on, on IVERS, but I think they are all, uh, we all know that um, the IVERS and um, FFR actually help to when to intervene, how to intervene, and how to optimize uh, lesions. And OCT have a bit limited data, and also the, the since it's a Philips uh, session, the, the, the IFR in left me a little bit um, uh, data a bit. Uh, uh, lacking, but there are two studies actually to show that um, it correlates quite well with FFR and um, um, with the R value of 0 0.67 and um, the sensitivity specificity is about 80%, but the concordance is only about 80 to 84% as compared to uh, FFR. And also one study to show that deferring left main intervention if the IFR is more than 0.89 appear to be safe in this study. Yeah. So um, also uh, pressure wire also have uh, limitation as well. First of all, uh, left main always come with other additional disease. Isolated left main is about one third. And if you have a significant disease in the um, LAD, it may affect the left main FFR. And if you have a CTO of the right with collaterals, it will affect the FFR as well. So the recommended uh, 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 the, 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 the MLA for left main uh, is six correlate with, uh, with uh, 0.75 of FFR. In Asian, maybe the, the value will be low, uh, a bit lower, 4.5 to 4.8. So it, I was, we help to guide the procedures, and this is the, the criteria that uh, you need to achieve with the um, uh, uh, left main bifurcation stenting. And meta analysis showed that IVERS, um, although there's no large randomized trial, uh, it showed that IVERS helped in all the uh, uh, different endpoints. And recently, uh, there's a published uh, Rolex registry which showed that um, IVERS guided uh, PCI. Uh, uh, OCD guided PCI showed much, much lower incidence of uh, a primary endpoint. And uh, quoting uh, uh, Erasmus, in the land of the blind, the one eye man is king. So if you're Ivers, uh, it'd be beneficial. Okay, so question to ask is, um, is it appropriate if to ever not use imaging for when you treat left main? What are your thoughts? I, I think you need to use left main. For left main PCI, you've got to use imaging. I think the ability for the operator to comfortably put a five or six O balloon and we've seen many studies showing people in registries that uh, they don't get the stent big enough for the left main. And even in small looking ladies, sometimes that left main is five. Yeah. And so I think you're doing a disservice to stenting a very important artery without even checking that this is appropriately sized. So I think that's a problem. So it's almost mandatory in left main stenting, I think. I mean, uh, clearly that is an issue because if you look at EBC, what is it, 30, 40% left main is very low. Yeah. And that's only in Europe. So can you imagine uh, places like in Asia? It's, it's going to be very difficult to try to push through. But um, uh, what, 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 what's your thoughts on this? Do you ever advocate a mandatory like Sydney does? Uh, no, doing it without imaging, never. I mean, I routinely image even non-left main uh, stenting. So I think in uh, absolutely, like Dr. Lowe said, uh, in terms of sizing the left main, uh, assessing disease burden at the ostium of the, the two main branches, but also, as Dr. Wong said, there's potentially a left circumflex stent protruding into the left main. So those are things that you cannot assess reliably with angiography alone. I would probably play a little bit of devil's advocate there. So, you know, we are living in a cost-conscious environment. There are many centers where IVUS is not available or the expertise to interpret IVUS is not there. I think the important thing is to understand that the left main is never three millimeters in any, in any human being. And that, that's the important thing to remember. And left mains are 4.0, 4.5, 5.0. And one way to approach it is to uh, look at the circumflex and look at the, the LED and make a pretty good guesstimate of what the left main should be. If your circumflex is 3.5 and your LED is 3.5, then the left main is likely to be 4.5. And so if you put a stent in the left main and you dilate, post dilate with a four and a half millimeter balloon, you are probably going to be okay. You will probably achieve M stent areas of 10 millimeters and above, which is what the cut point was on the Excel trial that made the biggest difference in terms of outcomes. So I think, yes, it is. I would agree with my colleagues. It is 
probably mandatory to use um, IBIS in left main PCI, but if you don't have access to it or you cannot use it, then know the numbers that you need to be aiming for. So note, sorry, note that you've mentioned specifically adequate post dilatation. Yeah. So I think if you're yeah. doing that and you're not imaging, it's a bare minimum to actually make sure that it's Correct. well dilated because yeah. otherwise it's never going to be the size. Yeah. You put a 4.0 stent there, yeah. it's probably not 4.0 if you just do nominal pressures. Agreed. You need to make sure it's well dilated. And that's basic angioplasty. You post dilate to get the best stent area. And the magic number with a non-compliant balloon is about 20 millimeters. You've got to get that, that balloon expanded. All right. So with regards to the technique, uh, you know, uh, you have said you probably try provisional first, uh, you know, and um, Aaron says he's going to go up front to stand technique. I, I think we would agree that uh, I would like to see an imaging first. If you're doing an imaging to decide one way or the other. So I want to mention that the strategy change. So let's say you decide to do provisional and you're the EBC group, not much imaging. So you just execute. And in that sense, in the trial, 20% may need to have a side branch stented. They don't know because they didn't image. But if you were doing imaging and you're imaging from both the LAD to left main, circumflex to left main, you may change that idea of a provisional. No, that's a two-stent strategy after I assessed it on imaging, in which case that may absolve you from having a bail-up procedure, doing a tap or something else more uncomfortably. If you execute a two-stent strategy well that you're comfortable with, it's a superior result in a suitable anatomy. Aaron, carry on. Yep, sure. So um, uh, we did the RCA first, but unfortunately the uh, six French uh, guide cannot go up the radial artery because of stenosis. So we use a five French uh, system for the radio. So this one is quite simple. Uh, we treat it with a scoring balloon with a DEB, uh, 3 five, uh, 30 DEB. So 30 mil of contrast was used. Uh, post PCI creatinine goes up to 256 and then went down to 200 again. Um, so it was electively uh, emitted for uh, a PCI. At the time the creatinine was 200. So this is the um, angiogram. Um, uh, we did a femoral approach because we couldn't go to the right radio. EBU 3.5 supporting guide. Uh, this is a baseline angiogram again. So we did the IVUS for the CERC and the RCA, but as you see, the uh, IVUS catheter cannot cross the OM branch. Yeah. So um, uh, this is the IVUS. So I think to, in order to save time, just to mention that there's a very tight lesion just before the OM branch. And also looking from the CERC into the OM branch, looks like the ostium is is quite patent, although it's not supposed to do that, yeah. And then the LED stand just touching the left main. It crossed the circumflex, just touching the left main. I think the wire goes um, underneath the, uh, the stand strap so that the, the catheter goes in well, but the OM branch actually go into the stand strap so the IVUS cannot go through. So we decided we just, uh, since the osteo OM is, is good, so we just leave it, not even a, a wire to protect. So just, um, so we pre-dilate the circ and LED first with the NC balloon. Um, it didn't, uh, I spent a while, so we use a Wolverine 3.0 and it expand quite, quite well. And then uh, deploy the stent. Again, there's a, a bit of waste there. And then I use the NC balloon uh, to dilate the, the circ stent before the crush. And then uh, the pot with the 4.0. And then recross first kiss. Left main stent. Deployed a 3.0 stent as well. Pot again. And then the final kiss. Yeah. So that's the... Uh, Technique that I use, yeah. All right. Uh, any, I know it's very short, but uh, anyone who con wants to I like to say that uh, it was great to get your contrast load down to the EGFR, which is great, ultra low contrast PCI. The ability for you to do that is your expertise with intracoronary imaging and the reluctance to inject x ray dye during the procedure. You need to stop yourself, sometimes disconnect the syringe. We learned that in CTO PCI, just disconnect the syringe and don't inject because otherwise someone's always going to try to inject. You always want to see something to make you comfortable. And so that is something we learned. The other thing is that you have to space out your contrast load from the angiogram to a stage procedure. If that one procedure, one vessel took too much, you're just going to watch for a bump, wait till it comes back to baseline before you hit it again with another contrast. So I think some patience there. I think one of the issues uh, is really with the circumflex, isn't it? This is where the circumflex comes back. The risk of coming back is much higher in the circumflex. So uh, what are the things that you would uh, consider to get good results and to reduce that risk of resinosis? Yeah, so I, I think Aaron very nicely demonstrated that. He pre-dilated adequately with the non-compliant balloon, got good expansion. Then he put a stent. And once he deployed the stent before he crushed it, he went, went in with an NC balloon 
and expanded that ostium even more with the high pressure NC balloon dilation, then crushed and did things. And so that's important. The other thing, of course, is that on your imaging, you will know if that circumflex is calcified and needs either ablation or shockwave therapy. Uh, because as you rightly said, the, the uh, recurrence rate is greatest at the osteal circumflex. And while the numbers that, were, that Aaron showed, five, six, seven, eight, five millimeters squared in the circumflex, those are kind of the, the rock, the bare minimum. You don't want to aim for five. You want to aim for a much bigger lumen area or stent area if you can. And so their expansion becomes the most important thing. So remember, guys, to, to, to do that extra effort to get long-term good results. So Aaron... Yep, so this is the final angiogram results. Um, um, the, the left main stand actually overlap with the LED stands at the midpoint. And uh, yep, of course, we need, need to do a final uh, IVUS. Have a look to, uh, to save time. Uh, the stand is well expanded. And this is the uh, MLA for circ, which is 8.3, 9.3 for LED, and 12 for left main. Yeah, that's all. I think those are very good results, both angiographically yeah. and also by uh, by IVUS, and that's very important. And the way did it uh, was very good. Any oh, any comment? I forgot to, yeah. to show one thing. Sorry, I went too fast. So, like Sydney said, I there is a wire tip perforation there, which I forgot to mention there. Yeah. yeah. So so it's very important to do a final shot. Yeah. And I wasted a little bit of contrast. <laughs> Keep, so take, make sure that that, that, that so we had a discussion right. prior and we talked about are anyone fans of zero contrast PCR and I said I'm not a fan because we're worried about safety and yeah. since you're doing all this fantastic work you want to make sure you don't leave the patient in, in issues and so the final shot when you can see the distal vessels really well is a way of seeing any distal problems like wire perforation so that's great long. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. a long sin is key and you know that's what a lot of people forget to do yes. because you're so excited that you got a great result. And as Fahim uh, said, I don't know whether it was uh, personal uh, to, to, to us just now, is that from the legal point of view, you need to have some uh, images to be seen. Correct. So uh, Fahim, many questions from the audience? Uh, I think there's, uh, I, I can see that somebody is asking about the nuclear scan showing mild ischemia in the inferior wall and... Uh, it's irreversible. Oh, actually, it was, it was no ischemia in the inferior wall, and they were asking whether, which is something you already mentioned, whether you can use IVUS to assess the significance of the left main. And so I, I think uh, the, the question to you, Aaron, would be that, you know, if this was somebody with stable disease, would your approach have been different? Because if this patient presented with an acute coronary syndrome, but let's say this was stable um, disease. But the how ischemia would trial actually excluded the, uh, the, the left main the subgroup, so I would... Um, still intervene because of the uh, FFR, uh, it LED is very significant, it's 0.7. Mm. So, um, so perhaps uh, I think uh, that's a very well uh, executed uh, case uh, to start uh, the discussion. We'll go on to subsequently uh, with regards to the ultra, uh, really ultra low contrast. And uh, to have this with us is Dr. Roberto uh, uh, Spina, uh, who's going to present a case and we'll take it on from there. Um, good afternoon, and thanks for having me. Um, so ultra-low contrast angiography and zero contrast PCI is a relatively not so new uh, technique. Um, the idea underlying it is that basically um, cardiovascular disease is very important in, in advanced uh, kidney disease, remains the leading cause of death after renal transplantation, and also because these patients have traditionally been excluded from randomized controlled trial, there is a paucity of data on, on what to do. Um, contrast nephropathy is potentially serious. As you can see, if you have baseline chronic kidney disease and you have contrast associated acute kidney injury, your uh, uh, risk of mortality and, and, uh, and MACE goes up. In general principles, Ultra-low contrast uh, and geography and PCI is not rocket science, but you do need to have a certain um, uh, comfort with intravascular ultrasound and physiology. First of all, contrast-associated acute kidney injury is defined as an absolute increase in the serum creatinine of about 25, 26 micromoles per liter within 48 hours of administration of intravascular contrast a relative increase in the creatinine uh, to 1.5 times the, the baseline or decrease in urinary volume. Usually the declining kidney function occurs two to three days after and returns to baseline in one or two weeks. 
So in general, the general principle underlying this in performing angiography and percutaneous core intervention safely in patients with advanced chronic kidney disease, recognize the problem. This sounds basic, but you know, often we sometimes forget in, to assess the renal function at baseline and ex assess the risk. The risk increases with baseline chronic kidney disease, advancing age, diabetes, volume depletion, sepsis, and other things. Um, there, there is one trial, the Poseidon trial, which was published in 2014, um, and this is a clinically validated strategy which has been become part of ultra-low contrast uh, angiography and PCI, where you measure the left ventricular end diastolic pressure uh, at the beginning of the procedure and then decide on adequate hydration. Uh, on, on a hard, uh, pr hydration protocol because patients with chronic kidney disease often have an elevated LVDP and standard uh, routine um, hydration protocols might not be ideal. So this is one of the pillars of ultra-low contrast. Not surprisingly, if you want to use less contrast, you need to use more intravascular imaging, which is why uh, it's, it's, it's best adopted in a program that uses uh, intravascular imaging uh, frequently. And the basic sort of principal tenets of ultra-low coronary angiography is, one, you try to, to, to maintain the total volume of contrast, uh, the ratio with the EGFR of less than one. So if your EGFR is 12, you try to use 12 mils of contrast. You use LVDP-guided hydration, as, as, um, dem as, as uh, demonstrated by the Poseidon trial. You don't puff with contrast when you try to engage the coronaries. Whenever you can, you remove contrast from the catheter. When you try to engage the coronaries, um, you inject saline rather than puff. Usually it's 10 mils of saline, and you'll notice some ECG changes, which I'll show later. Um, if, you, if you're not too sure, you can always probe the artery with a workhorse wire, and if it follows the expected course of the artery, you know that you're engaged. Um, Another important aspect is to try to, when you uh, take a picture, scene acquisition should be done at 30 frames per second. That increases the quality of the picture. Use low magnification and no panning. And you inject through small catheters, five French, and using small syringes, three to five mils. Two scene acquisitions for the left coronary system, usually uh, AP cranial, AP caudal, and one scene acquisition for the right coronary artery. When a lesion is found or the procedure is staged and at zero contrast PCI is planned, the same, we use LV, EDP guided hydration, catheter engagement confirmation with intracoronary saline or workhorse wires. You try and use a coronary metal silhouette, which means using several wires to, to create a silhouette which can help navigate the PCI. You use intracoronary physiology, obviously, a spot IFR to confirm ischemia and a pullback IFR to localize ischemia. Intravascular imaging is important in marking the distal reference for our stent um, and manual co-registration, automatic co-registration is important. And finally, intracoronary physiology at the end of the procedure, spot to confirm resolution of the ischemia following PCI and a pullback to confirm optimal DES uh, optimization. So this is one case, a 68-year-old male with diabetes, normal left ventricular function, advanced chronic kidney disease with an EGFR of 13, presents with progressive angina and dyspnea. So as a first step, with a pigtail catheter in the left ventricle, we measure the LV EDP and, and then decide on hydration. This is the confirmation of catheter engage, uh, engagement baseline and after intracoronary injection of 10 mils of saline, you can see the changes in the T waves. Um, if some advocates of ultra um, con coronary angiography recommend using the femoral route because the radial approach might be required for future uh, fi uh, fistula formation. You can see um, the EGFR in this patient is 13, so we're gonna try and keep the contrast less than 13 mils. The right coronary artery we get a good opacification with only 2.9 mils. Um, and then the left coronary artery with six mils, we get a fairly uh, good idea of, of what we're looking at. So this, this patient has multivessel coronary artery disease um, with a middle AD that looks significant, an, an OM lesion that's possibly significant and a mid-right coronary artery. So again, we use physiology liberally. The IFR is of the RCA is negative. 
the IFR of that OM branch is negative as well. The LAD, however, is uh, mildly hemodynamically significant at 0.87, with a focal step back in the mid-vessel. So at this stage, um, when we're planning the, th in this case, we're using a rotational I IVUS, the Refinity 40 megahertz rotational IVUS. We have a wire, workhorse wire down, and we've decided what is the distal uh, reference for our stent, and we image it. We do a cine acquisition where we think, uh, where we've decided that the distal reference is on the, on the ultrasound on the IVUS, and the EEL to EEL here is 2.8. So we've got a, a, a distal reference, and then we do a, a motorized pullback, so we will be able to, to calculate a stent length. Proximally, the vessel is 4.1, distally, as we said, 2.8. There's a fibrocalcific lesion in the, in the mid-stent. So we've measured about 30 millimeters. Without any further contrast, we deploy the stent using the right-sided uh, image as a guide. We optimize the stent, proximally with a 3.5 and distally with a 2.0. Remember, proximally the vessel was 4.1. And then uh, finally, uh, a post-PCI um, uh, IVUS demonstrates that the, the stent is a bit constrained with the MSA of 2.61 and further uh, after further post dilatation, further stent optimization at slightly higher pressure, we recheck our results. We have not used any contrast. Um, PCI physiology is normal in the D1, and the PCI physiology in the uh, LAD has normalized. At the completion of the procedure, um, firstly, we recheck the LVDP to see whether we need to change our hydration protocol. And to avoid taking uh, another senior angiography, we, we do a bedside uh, echocardiogram to screen for small pericardial effusion, which might suggest coronary perforation. Um, the caveat is that if the patient develops symptoms or significant ECG changes or a new pericardial effusion, we do take uh, inject contrast. Um, I, might, I might move on to the second case. Um, I think perhaps we may not have the time for the second case, but um, but I must thank you for, for for presenting this case because the thoughtfulness, the planning, the strategy to go on is extremely important because in the end, uh, it's all about planning. And secondly, to me, is that it appears that the use of uh, anatomy, the use of imaging is very important, especially when you want to dilate and uh, when you want to uh, put in the stand and post-dilate, putting the stand and trying to not to miss those are important issues, fine? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, beautifully executed case. I mean, it shows the, so low contrast PCI is a cognitive process. It is not, it is much more difficult than giving in a gallon of contrast and, and doing doing the procedure. And the, the thought process involved is very, very in, in, integrate. Uh, I'd like to point out something, maybe I'd, I'd like Sydney to just talk to us about this. You, you saw that, you know, uh, Roberto did, a, you know, put in a stent, post-dilated, and, you know, did everything he could to get a great result. And he didn't take, do an angiogram, but if he'd done one, more than likely it would have, would have looked great. But then when he IVSed, he found that there was areas that were not so good. And so, Sydney, talk to us in your experience. How often does that, does IVS surprise you when you go in and interrogate a seemingly good job that you've done? So, actually, a lot of the time. The more you image, the more you'll find things you didn't know was happening. Particularly, the stents were underexpanded in certain spots, which is very commonly done. A 2.5 millimeter stent, maybe only two at some lesion, because it hasn't really been properly expanded. So I don't think, uh, but physiology may reveal that if we're doing the synergy, the great case, Roberto, because it, you demonstrated the physiology was corrected after the procedure. And of course, the pullback would tell you as well. And I was very interested in your co-registration without any contrast in the artery, no angiogram. Notice they've used a side branch wire they did a pullback. They did a, a cine angiogram on the time that the, the distal point at which they're doing it. Now you can actually do a manual pullback and pick the point of landing zone, take a picture there, and, and that will literally on the x-ray uh, co-register for you where you need to land your distal part of the They're very useful thing to do, very good trick. 
Um, the only problem with the echo screening is that, as we know from CTO PCI, is that often the, the peak problem is four hours post uh, to PCI, is that they bleed slowly, tap on occurs when you're home, and someone rings your butt pressure 60, thing, oh, please do an echo, please do a tap, because that's a few hours later. So I think that doesn't, and, and personally, a little bit of contrast at the end just makes me feel more comfortable. And notice it's a comfort level of the physician during yeah. the procedure. But, but I think you pointed out something, the complementary role of physiology and imaging. So you may fix the physiology by putting in an underdeployed stent, and your FFR may actually normalize, or IFR may normalize, but the stent may still be underexpanded. And so I think the imaging mitigates problems related to an underexpanded stent, and that is so important that, uh, you know, the case that uh, Roberto just showed, uh, and, you know, certainly hats off to you. And, and, and not just that, the imaging is also very important because to look for the edge stent, for potential edge stent dissection, because you might miss it, and it's very important not to miss an edge uh, stent dissection. Um, Aaron, how often do you use this um, really ultra-low contrast in your practice? Um, I, I, I use it um, maybe uh, last year, maybe about uh, five, ten cases of a patient. Yeah, not, not, not many, not many, because uh, ultra-low is, yeah, is really low. But like, you no know, 50, 60 sort of, for very complex situations, I think it's, it's acceptable. <laughs> so I think we just need to be better, right? I mean, I think that you can set a limit and you just need to do better. We say not be so generous with our contrast in the cases. But obviously, for those really tricky patients like the one bumps with 33 mils of contrast, you want to be really good with those. And because you, it's the renal outcomes are terrible. And so we, we need to be careful. And I think if we get with the contrast shortage, we did angiography with a lot less contrast and the PCI with a lot less contrast. I think it's a conscious decision. The, the physicians, physicians stepping up and getting better at imaging and trying to deliver the cases that came with lower contrast. I think it's great. And it's two words, don't puff. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anything else on, from your side that you want to share with us, uh, Rob, Roberto? What? All right. Um, great. So I think we, we sort of reached the end. I just, just, you know, you saw imaging, you saw physiology guiding you to do a complex case which Aaron showed, and also guiding you to do a very low contrast PCI. And this just highlights how versatile physiology and imaging are in the, in the arsenal of interventional cardiology. And they're mutually exclusive, they, they're complementary. You cannot rely, you know, use one for the other. They actually both have a concomitant role. So thank you very much, everybody, for being here. And thank you to, uh, I let uh, Rosley. Yeah. Uh, just finalize. to add on on what Fahim says is number one is just to re realize that there are technologies that is available to us to try to make our, it's like precision PCI. Uh, there's a term for it, and to make it safer. Uh, and you know, get better results. Obviously, there will be limitation in terms of uh, the availability of device, but uh, at least you know. And when you want to plan for your cath lab and you have some resources, these are the things that come to your mind uh, to try and ins uh, ensure that you have got a better system. That's number one. Uh, so low, ultra low contrast, again, has been stated again. Practice and practice. Try to, uh, to hold your hands, not to give uh, no, this puff and so on. Remember, even when you put in a balloon, just make sure that uh, you dilate it at the proper side, just using anatomy. So practice to try to reduce contrast, at least to try to reduce the contrast in practice. And last but not least is that stage your procedure. It doesn't necessarily mean that you, you, know, you have to do everything in one go, but in the end, the kidneys fail. So in this case, uh, again, uh, try to think about safety, not just success in terms of results, but safety is as important. So I must, uh, I'd like to thank all the presenters, Fahim, uh, Sydney for being here, and of course, Philps uh, for the generous grant. Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen.